yesterday, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. I ask that the Congress declare that since the unprovoked and dastardly attack, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. My grandpa was a Quaker, and he had quite an influence on my life, talking and so forth. So I, I guess I envisioned myself as a conscientious objector, but when Pearl Harbor happened and uh, other people around me were going to war, I, I felt that it was not only my duty, but my privilege to serve the country. Although I was 13 years old at the time, I knew that I was big enough and strong enough and I was a good shot, so I just became obsessed that I had to do something. I was mad because my ancestors gave me damage, but my feeling was I was born here in America and I'm going to be American. I, along with a lot of other Americans, young, young people, thought, well, if our country is threatened and we're going to lose our freedom, then we're going to go fight. I had a lot of relatives that was in the Second World War. And my hero was always those people in uniform and the stories my uncle told about his experience in the military. My father and all of my uncles died as a result of their service during the Second World War. I think my first prayer that I can remember uttering in seriousness was that I would someday have the privilege to grow up and serve. I landed on D-Day, and we're right there in the monks with the first wave on the beach. And uh, when we landed, we weren't prepared for the chaos that we saw. There was just bodies and boats sinking and things like this all over. And was in water over my head with my rifle over my head. I had a rosary in my hand. And before I knew it, we hit the beaches. I lost my rosary. It's the first time I've ever prayed in my life. And I I figured if I, every time I need help, this is when it is. We went down and set up our machine guns up on the hill, and all hell broke loose. Where the hell they came from, nobody knew. I mean, the war is now there, right now. One minute I'm warm in bed with a pretty blonde, and the next minute I'm down there, captured there. We were only eight planes, and the sky was black with dive bombers. They were all over the place. Smiley Burnett said, my God, there's millions of them. They said to my company commander, the tanks cannot operate in this terrain. Well, about four o'clock the next morning, here come German tanks bumper to bumper. The whole regiment, battalion by battalion, went up, got cut to pieces. And when they were driven back down, we knew it was our turn. So we just moved up against terrible odds and we're scared to death. But your responsibility is to lead your men into very dangerous areas on occasion, and you have no choice but to do it. We knew we had a minefield to go through, numerous mines. So that was the first thing we had to do. So we had a prayer, and we got ready to go. I said to my men, OK, let's go. Move out. Nobody moves. What do you do? I said, well, someone has to move, so I guess I'll just have to go by myself. So I stopped and looked around. I didn't see anybody, just bodies everywhere. Uh, I don't know what possessed me to do it, but I says, tell everybody over there to fix bayonets. I'm going over the hill. So I hollered at the group, watch for the machine gun up there. My buddy stands up for some reason, and he says, where? And the machine gun shot him. I said, and I held him. <laughs> Why? I was so mad, I cried, and I ran up that hill. The adrenaline was running real hard. We were moving, shooting, and no salute, I guarantee you. And then during all this, somebody yelled grenade, and I looked down, saw it, and fell on it. 
I knew full well, you know, what was going to happen. I knew that I probably wouldn't survive, but uh, somebody had to do it. And uh, it just happened to be me. I try to assure my children that character is developed, and it's unfortunately it's usually developed with negative experiences. Some people develop it without these experiences, but it, I don't know any of them. These metals usually are associated with some action of sacrifice. It's difficult for them to understand the degree of sacrifice. One thing that I did after the war, I went back to France and through Germany and found the spot where each of the men that served me was killed. And I wondered what could I have done differently we don't like to fight, but uh, when it comes down to it, uh, that's what has to be done as it is in Iraq right now. And the people there are heroic. I think they're doing just a tremendous job, those young soldiers. And every time you see a newsreel film of one of them looking in the tunnel, he's risking his life. Every time you see one of them breaking down a door, he's risking his life. And he's doing it not for himself, he's doing it for somebody else. It doesn't matter what war you're in, War is war is war. We fight for the freedom of the citizens of this country, and uh, that freedom uh, is very, very costly. Freedom doesn't come cheap. Uh, you know, somebody's got to pay for it. And I was proud of what I'd done. But as I got older, I, uh, I like to think more about the people I saved than, uh, than the people I killed. The worst thing that can happen to a human being is to have to take the life of another human being. You will never, ever forget it. But there is one reason that soldiers can do that terrible thing, and that reason is you. That's their only reason for doing that, is you. So you think about it on Veterans Day, because that's what it was. I think of the people I've met that have earned this medal. I mean, when I first got decorated, I was the 4th Marine from Vietnam. My first convention, I stood next to Pappy Boynton on one side of me, and Jimmy Doodle on the other side of me, and Joe Foss come up and slapped me on the back. Now, does it get any better than that? I mean, it doesn't. I mean, to me, Pappy Boynton, Jimmy Doolittle, these guys, guys I had read about, I'm now in their situation, or I'm in their society, or their group. Now, that to me was something. Everyone that's ever served in our military has a part of this. You know, I have the privilege of doing a great deal of speaking to our young men and women in the service today, and I'll hand it to them, and they'll say, well, Sergeant, we can't, we can't hold that. I said, no, you have to hold it, because if you don't feel a part of it, if you don't feel like that's part yours, then it has less value. It's a symbol of, of a valuing of something greater than self. It's a symbol of something that has been in the lives and in the hearts of men and women since this country began. It's a tremendous legacy. It's a tremendous honor to be able to hold something like this and wear it. When you receive the Medal of Honor, you're automatically a role model for every kid in the whole nation. And I tell them basically that of all the options that you have available, if you select the one you most would not like to do, that's probably the right thing to do. I'm alive today because I am damn good men, huh? We're in a free country, and we, why are we? Because a lot of people, black, white, yellow, went and gave their lives so that you and I can live free, huh? Simple as that. But we need to remember these are not old soldiers, those are young men, and they're still there. They haven't aged a bit. I can still see them uh, just as plain as day, a lot of them that they're still there. The day I was born, I was handed a gem that is absolutely impossible to buy. That was my freedom. Can't pay for it. There's not enough money in the world. So this medal, to me, stands for sacrifice and service.